Lesson 6 for January 30 to February 5 Playing God and read by Dr. Percy Harold Sabbath afternoon, January 30 Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is just one God and that is you and we thank you that your word not only teaches us so but shows us how that works in our lives. But sometimes... We try to play God and we don't want to be able to do that, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we open the book of Isaiah to chapter 13 to see how we can relate much better to you. As we read your word this week, we pray that our lives may be changed in such a way that not only will others see the change, but that they may be affected positively for it as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 9. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's read that again. Isaiah 25 verse 9. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. After a minister had preached a searching sermon on pride, a woman who had heard the sermon waited for him and told him that she was in much distress of mind, and that she would like to confess a great sin. The minister asked her what the sin was. She answered, the sin of pride For I sat for an hour before my mirror some days ago admiring my beauty. Oh, responded the minister, that was not a sin of pride, that was a sin of imagination. And that's from the compilation by Paul Lee Tan, Encyclopedia of 7,700 Illustrations, Signs of the Times, page 1,100. Ever since sin was born in the heart of a mighty angel, pride has not respected the boundaries of reality, in angels or people. Nowhere is this problem seen worse than in those who harbour spiritual pride, a rather sorry trait in being so corrupted that their salvation can be found only in the works of another in their behalf. This week... Among other things, we'll take a look at the origin of pride and self-exaltation. Sunday, January 31. Doom on the Nations. Our text this week is Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13 1 has a heading that names Isaiah as the author. The burden against Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. We're going to compare that with Isaiah 1 verse 1, the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It seems also to begin a new section of his book. Chapters 13 through to 23 contain oracles of judgment against various nations. Let's take a look. Question. Why do the prophecies against the nations begin with Babylon? Isaiah 10 verses 5 to 34, which we read recently, already had announced judgment against Assyria, which posed the greatest danger in Isaiah's day while Isaiah 14, 24-27 briefly reiterates the Lord's plan to break Assyria, chapters 13-23 to deal mainly with other threats, Babylon being the most important. Let's look at Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass, and as I have purposed, so it shall stand. 
that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and on my mountains tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? Endowed with a rich and ancient cultural, religious and political legacy, Babylon later emerged as the superpower that conquered and exiled Judah. But, from the human perspective of Isaiah's time, it would not have been readily apparent that Babylon would threaten God's people. During much of Isaiah's ministry, Assyria dominated Babylon. From 728 BC, when Tiglath-Pileser III took Babylon and was proclaimed king of Babylon under the throne name Pulu, or Pul, as we read in 2 Kings 15.19 and 1 Chronicles 5.26, Assyrian kings retook Babylon several times, 710 BC, 702 BC, 689 BC and 648 BC. Babylon, however, eventually would become the great superpower in the region, the power that would destroy the Judean kingdom. Let's just check those texts in Second Kings 15.19. Pul, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to strengthen the kingdom under his control. And First Chronicles chapter 5. And verse 26. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, that is, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria. He carried the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh into captivity. He took them to Halor, Habor, Hara, and the region of Gozan to this day. And so to finish today, read through Isaiah chapter 13 and notice how strong the language is. Why does a loving God do these things or allow these things to happen? Certainly, some innocent people will suffer as well, wouldn't they? Let's read Isaiah chapter 13, the burden against Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Lift up a banner on the high mountain, raise your voice to them. Wave your hand that they may enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, those who rejoice in my exaltation. The noise of a multitude in the mountains like that of many people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. The Lord and his weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore all hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible." I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger, it shall be as the hunted gazelle, and as a sheep that no man takes up, every man will turn to his own people, and every one will flee to his own land." Everyone who is found will be thrust through, and everyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Their children also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered, and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, who will not regard silver, and as for gold, they will not delight in it. 
Also their bows will dash the young men to pieces, and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eye will not spare children, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabians pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, and jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. How do we understand this action by God? What should these texts and all the texts in the Bible that talk about God's anger and wrath against sin and evil tell us about the egregious nature of sin and evil? Isn't the mere fact that a God of love would respond this way enough evidence to show us just how bad sin is? We have to remember that this is Jesus speaking these warnings through Isaiah, the same Jesus who forgave, healed, pleaded with and admonished sinners to repent. In your own mind, how have you come to understand this aspect of a loving God's character? Ask yourself this question as well. Could not this wrath actually stem from his love? If so, how so? Or look at it from another perspective, that of the cross, where Jesus himself, bearing the sins of the world, suffered worse than anyone else ever has suffered even those innocents who suffered because of the sins of the nation. How does the sufferings of Christ on the cross help answer these difficult questions? Monday, February 1. The Late Great City of Babylon. And our text for today is Isaiah 13, verses 2 to 22, but we'll come to that later. In 626 BC, the Chaldean Nabopolassar restored Babylonian glory by making himself king in Babylon, beginning the Neo-Babylonian dynasty, and participating with Media in the defeat of Assyria. His son, Nebuchadnezzar, too, was the king who conquered and exiled Judah. Question. How did the city of Babylon finally end? Let's read Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he traced the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine, and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. At the same time, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. 
Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom, in whom is the Spirit of the Holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honour, and because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished... He executed, and whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up, and whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, And this writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written, Many, many, tekel, euphasen. This is the interpretation of each word. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple, and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about sixty-two years old. In 539 BC, when Cyrus the Persian captured Babylon for the Medo-Persian Empire, as we've just read in Daniel 5, the city lost its independence forever. In 482 BC, Xerxes I brutally suppressed a revolt of Babylon against Persian rule. He removed the statue of Marduk, the chief god, and apparently damaged some fortifications and temples. Alexander the Great took Babylon from the Persians in 331 BC without a fight. In spite of his short-lived dream to make Babylon his eastern capital, the city declined over several centuries. By AD 198, the Roman Septimus Severus found Babylon completely deserted. So the great city came to an end through abandonment. 
Today, Samaraiki villagers live on parts of the ancient site, but they have not rebuilt the city as such. The doom of Babylon, described in Isaiah 13, liberates the descendants of Jacob, who had been oppressed by Babylon, as we read in Isaiah 14, verses 1 to 3. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will still choose Israel, and settle them in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them, and they will cling to the house of Jacob. Then people will take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. They will take them captive, whose captives they were, and rule over their oppressors. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow, and from your fear, and the hard bondage in which you were made." to serve. The event that accomplished this was the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus in 539 BC. Although he did not destroy the city, this was the beginning of the end for Babylon, and it never threatened God's people again. Isaiah 13 dramatizes the fall of Babylon as a divine judgment. The warriors who take the city are God's agents, as we read in Isaiah 13, 2 to 5. Lift up a banner on the high mountain, raise your voice to them. Wave your hand that they may enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones by my anger, those who rejoice in my exaltation. The noise of a multitude in the mountains like that of many people. A tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. The Lord and his weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land. The time of judgment is called the day of the Lord, as we read in Isaiah 13. 6. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as a destruction from the Almighty. And verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. And God's anger is so powerful, it affects the stars, sun, moon, heavens, and earth. In Isaiah 13, verse 10. And the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause to light its light to shine. And verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Compare Judges chapter 5 where the song of Deborah and Barak describes the Lord as going forth with quaking of the earth and with rain from the heavens. As you read in Judges 5 verse 4, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water. Judges 5 verses 20 and 21 depicts the elements of nature, including stars, as fighting against the foreign oppressor. Beginning at verse 20, they fought from the heavens, the stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away, that ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. O my soul, march on in strength. And so to finish today... Imagine that someone living in Babylon at the height of its glory might read these words in Isaiah 13, particularly Isaiah 13, 19 to 22. How foolish and impossible they would have seemed. Let's have a look at those. Isaiah 13, 19 to 22. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, and jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. How foolish and impossible they would have seemed. 
What other prophecies yet unfulfilled seem foolish and impossible to us now? Why would we be foolish, however, to dismiss them as impossible? Tuesday, February 2. Fall of the Mountain King In response to the fall of Babylon in Isaiah 13, which frees God's people in Isaiah 14, 1-3, Isaiah 14, 4-23 utters a figurative taunt. Let's read that. Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 4. That you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, Now the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. Hell from beneath is excited about you, to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. They all shall speak and say to you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you, the worms cover you. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them, sleep in glory, every one in his own house. But you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who were slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial." because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children, because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land, and fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant, and offspring and posterity, says the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the porcupine and marshes of muddy water. I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. And we compare this with Micah 2 verse 4. In that day one shall take up a proverb against you and lament with a bitter lamentation, saying, We are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people, how he has removed it from me. To a turncoat he has divided his fields. And Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 6. Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases! What is not his? How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges and all this against the king of Babylon. It is poetic, not meant to be literal, obviously, as it portrays dead kings greeting their new colleagues in the realm of death, in verses 9 and 10, where maggots and worms are his bedding, in verse 11. This is simply the Lord's dramatic way of telling the haughty king that he shall be brought low, as other proud monarchs before him. It is not a commentary on the state of the dead. 
question, how could Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, apply to the king of Babylon? Let's look at those individual verses there now, beginning at verse 12. How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Babylonian kings did not suffer from lack of self-esteem, as you'll remember from the stories in Daniel 4 and 5. But aspiring to be like the Most High, as we read here in Isaiah 14 verse 14, would be beyond even the most inflated ego. While kings claimed strong connections with the gods, they were subservient to them. This was dramatically demonstrated every year on the fifth day of the Babylonian New Year festival, in which the king was required to remove his royal insignia before approaching the statue of Marduk, so his kingship could be reaffirmed. The idea of displacing even a lesser god would have been looked upon as crazy and suicidal. As in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 identifies heaven-daring arrogance with the ruler of a city. Here also, the description goes beyond that of an earthly monarch, and God's crosshairs come into sharper focus. The proud potentate was in the Garden of Eden, an anointed covering or guardian cherub on God's holy mountain, perfect from the day he was created until sin was found in him, cast out by God, and will eventually be destroyed by fire, as you read in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verses 12 to 18. Son of man, Take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Applied to any human being, the specific terms of this rhetoric are so figurative as to be meaningless. But Revelation 12, 7-9 does tell of a mighty being who was cast out of heaven with his angels, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Let's read Revelation 12, verses 7-9. to and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And that's who deceived Eve in Eden, as we read in Genesis chapter 3. Satan has a proud imagination. You have said, I am a god, I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a mortal and no god, Ezekiel 28 verse 2. The manner of his death will prove he is no god. 
unlike Christ, Satan will perish in the heart of a sea of fire, as we read in Revelation 20, verse 10, never to haunt the universe again. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. And so to finish the day, compare Isaiah 14, 13 and 14 with Matthew eleven twenty nine, John 13, 5 and Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And John 13, verse 5. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. And have you ever noticed... This series of texts occurs in every series of Sabbath school lessons. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. What does this contrast tell us about the character of God as opposed to the character of Satan? What does this contrast tell us about how the Lord views pride, arrogance and the desire for self-supremacy? Wednesday, February 3. Heaven's Gate. In Isaiah chapter 14, a taunt against Satan, the fallen, day star, in the King James Version it's called Lucifer, and son of dawn in the New Revised Standard Version. Let's just read it in the uh, New King James Version. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. This is blended into a taunt against the king of Babylon. Why? Well, let's compare Revelation 12, 1 to 9. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Here, a dragon identified as Satan, in verse 9, tries to destroy a child as soon as it is born. In Revelation 12, verse 5, the child clearly is Christ. But it was King Herod who tried to kill Jesus as a young child, as we read in Matthew chapter 2. The dragon is both Satan and the Roman power represented by Herod, because Satan works through human agents. Similarly, Satan was the power behind the king of Babylon and the prince of Tyre. 
Question, why does Babylon later refer to Rome in 1 Peter 5 and verse 13? She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. And to an evil power in the book of Revelation, as we read in the following verses. Revelation 14, verse 8, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation sixteen nineteen. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Revelation 17, verse 5, And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. And Revelation 18, verse 2, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. And verse 10, Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And verse 21, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. Like literal Babylon, Rome and the Babylon of Revelation are proud, ruthless powers that oppress God's people. See especially Revelation 17, 6 which reads, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marvelled with great amazement. For it is drunk with the blood of the saints. They rebel against God, an idea implied in the name Babylon itself. In the Babylonian language, the name is bab Eli. that's B-A-B, another word, I-L-I, which means the gate of gods, referring to the place of access to the divine realm. Compare Genesis 11, where people built the Tower of Babel, Babylon, so that by their own power they could rise to the divine level of immunity from any accountability to God. When Jacob awoke from a dream in which he saw a ladder connecting heaven and earth, he exclaimed in Genesis 28.17, This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Notice that the house of God is the gate of heaven, that is, the way of access to the divine realm. Jacob named the place Bethel, which means house of God. The gate of heaven at Bethel and the gate of gods at Babylon were opposite ways to reach the divine realm. Jacob's ladder originated in heaven, revealed from above by God. But Babylon, with its towers and ziggurat temples, was built by human beings from the ground up. These opposite ways represent contrasting paths to salvation, divinely initiated grace versus human works. All true religion is based on the humble Bethel model, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Let's read that in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All false religion, including legalism and secular humanism, is based on the proud Babylonian model. For the contrast between the two approaches, see Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the publican in Luke eighteen nine to 14 Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, 
but beat his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, to finish the day. Even after spending a few years in a Zen monastery, Canadian songwriter Leonard Cohen told an interviewer, I'm not saved. In the context of today's study, what do you think his problem was? What did he need to know about salvation? Thursday, February 4, Final Triumph of Zion Following oracles against individual nations in Isaiah chapter 13 through to chapter 23, Isaiah 24 to 27 describes on a worldwide scale the climactic defeat of God's enemies and the deliverance of his people. Question why does Isaiah's description of the desolation of the earth in Isaiah 24 look like John's description of events connected with 1,000 years that follow Christ's second coming in Revelation 20? Well, let's start by reading Isaiah chapter 24. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land shall be entirely empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. The new wine fails, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh. A mirth of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the jubilant ends, the joy of the harp ceases. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may go in. There is a cry for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. In the city, desolation is left, and the gate is stricken with destruction. When it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of an olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Therefore glorify the Lord in the dawning light, the name of the Lord God of Israel in the coastlands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we have heard songs. Glory to the righteous. But I said I am ruined, ruined. Woe to me! The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Indeed, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth, and it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth, they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and will be shut up in the prison. After many days they will be punished. 
Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his elders gloriously. And then we compare that with Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the keys to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him, so that he should receive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And any one not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. As in Isaiah 13 and 14, aspects of literal Babylon apply to later powers and the king of Babylon represents fusion of human rulers with the mastermind behind them, Satan himself. So, a message that Babylon is fallen, in Isaiah 21 verse 9, And look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. Then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen and is fallen, and all the carved images of her gods he has broken to the ground, can be repeated at a later time in Revelation 14 verse 8 and another angel followed saying Babylon is fallen is fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and Revelation 18 2 and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird And Satan is finally destroyed after the millennium, as we read in chapter 20 and verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, for ever and ever. While the destruction of literal Babylon was a judgment day of the Lord, as it says in Isaiah thirteen six and 9, another great and terrible day of the Lord in Joel 2.31, Malachi 4.5 and Zephaniah 1.7 is on its way. Let's look at those texts. First of all, Joel 2 and verse 31. 
The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And Malachi 4 verse 5 Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And Zephaniah 1 7 Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. Similarly, in Isaiah 24, the prophet's vision reaches through conditions with which he is familiar to the time when, as it says in verse 23, the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Isaiah undoubtedly thought the vision applied to the Jerusalem he knew, but the book of Revelation explains that it will actually be fulfilled in the new Jerusalem. As we read in Revelation 21 verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And in Revelation 21:23 we read, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Question. Does God really destroy the wicked? Look at Isaiah 28 verse 21, where God's work of destruction is his strange deed. As we read in that verse, Isaiah 28 21, For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. It is strange for him because he doesn't want to do it, but it is nevertheless a deed or an act. It is true that sin carries the seeds of self-destruction, as we read in James 1 and verse 15. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full-grown, brings forth death. But, because God has ultimate power over life and death, and He determines the time, place and manner of final destruction, as we read in Revelation 20, it is pointless to argue that He ultimately determines the curse of sin in a passive way, by simply allowing cause and effect to take its natural course. So to finish today... What we see in Isaiah chapter 24 to 27 is what we see reflected in the entire Bible, which is that no matter the suffering, pain and desolation now, in the end God and goodness will triumph over evil. What then is the only thing we can do if we ourselves want to be part of that final victory? The answer lies in several verses here. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. And Romans 10, verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Friday, February 5. From Manuscript Releases, Volume 5, page 32, we read, Is it by conditions that we receive salvation, never by conditions that we come to Christ? And if we come to Christ, then what is the condition? The condition is that by living faith we lay hold wholly and entirely upon the merits of the blood of a crucified and risen Saviour. When we do that, then we work the works of righteousness. But when God is calling the sinner in our world and inviting him, there is no condition there. He draws by the invitation of Christ, and it is not. Now you have got to respond in order to come to the cross. 
The sinner comes, and as he comes, and views Christ elevated upon that cross of Calvary which God impresses upon his mind, there is a love beyond anything that is imagined that he has taken hold of. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Look at the above quote from Ellen G. White. Read it in the context of Wednesday's study. What is she telling us there? Notice in her statement both elements of the Christian walk, faith and then works. How does she differentiate between them? 2. Why are pride and arrogance such dangerous sins? Why are they so hard to put away? Can it be because by their very nature they blind people to their need to put them away? After all, if you are proud, you think you're okay. And if you think you are okay... Why bother changing? How can dwelling on the cross and what it represents, the only means of saving anyone, be a powerful cure for pride and arrogance in anyone? And three, does Isaiah see hope for people of other nations? For example, Isaiah 25 verse 3, Therefore the strong people will glorify you, the city of the terrible nations will fear you. Isaiah 25, verse 6, And in this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. And Isaiah 26, and verse 9, With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants, inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And we compare that with Revelation 19 verse 9. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And so to summarize this week's lesson, Isaiah saw that following Assyria, Babylon would conquer Judah. But he also saw that in spite of superhuman rulers of the darkness of this world, as explained in Ephesians 6.12, working through God's human enemies and presuming to play God, the Lord would decisively prevail and bring eternal peace to our troubled planet. And so we finish with Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Missing Commandment, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Valentina Schlee was astounded when her older sister Galena announced that they were not keeping all of the Ten Commandments in their hometown in northern Kazakhstan. Valentina opened her Bible and read through the commandments. When she reached the fourth, she stopped. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, she read in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. She and Galena resolved to find a church that observed the seventh day Sabbath. But where should they look? Let's do it like this, Valentina told Galena. If the Bible is really the true word of God, there must be a church that follows all ten commandments. Let's pray about it. The sisters prayed for three months. If there is a church that keeps all the commandments, please lead us to it, Valentina prayed. 
One day, Valentina felt an irresistible urge to visit Nellie, a relative. She didn't know what came over her. Usually, she stayed at home all day with her two-year-old son. At Nellie's house, Valentina and Nellie were talking when another relative, Olga, rang the doorbell. Olga was not a close relative. In fact, Valentina had heard that she had joined a dangerous sect called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the house, Olga didn't mince words. "'What do you think about God?' she asked Valentina. Valentina ignored the question and asked one of her own. "'Do you keep all the commandments?' she said. "'Do you keep the Seventh-day Sabbath?' Hours later, Valentina informed Galena that the Seventh-day Adventist Church observes all Ten Commandments. Several months later, the sisters were baptised together. Through the Holy Word, God led us to the church that keeps all Ten Commandments, Valentina said. And there's a photograph of Valentina here as well. Part of the 2017 13 Sabbath offering helped open one of the first Seventh-day Adventist preschools in Valentina's hometown, Pavlodar, in Kazakhstan. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.